Hi. Um, this is going to be something a little different from what we've done in previous meetings. Um, what we are going to uh, go over today is implementing uh, these care guidelines that were put together. Um, the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation put out an initiative in September 10th of 2015. So this has been three years in the making um, in order to develop these care guidelines for myotonic dystrophy. The goal of which is to help develop care teams for you to help you get the best, best possible clinical care. Um, uh, a steering committee was founded. Uh, it included, and I hope I have not missed any names, Dr. Ashizawa, uh, Dr. Gagnon, Sharon Hesterly, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Miola, Dr. Pandya, Dr. Rogers, Dr. Simpson, and Dr. Bolin, as well as Dr. Gro and Dr. Moxley. Uh, they and 66 other experts in the field of all of the different multi-system involvement in myotonic dystrophy were involved. And these experts came from the United States, from the United Kingdom, and from Canada. These guidelines were just published literally days ago in the Neurology Clinical Care Journal, and they'll also be available on the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation website. The document is 55 pages long, but we've written a short version. There's a Reader's Digest version, which is the four-page quick reference version. So if you all look in your bag, if you all look in your bag, there's a four-page quick reference guide in there, but there's also an MDF clinic visit planner that's laminated with a, with a pen. And that's what we're going to talk about today. One of the things that I wanted to mention is that we're not going to touch on all of the dis different systems that were uh, written about in these care consideration guidelines. It is very expansive. It covers everything from anesthesia risk, respiratory involvement, um, excessive daytime sleepiness, cardiac involvement, ocular symptoms, malignancy, endocrine problems, metabolic problems, clinical trials counseling, as well as the skeletal muscle weakness, rehabilitation, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech and swallowing issues, gastrointestinal issues, the myotonia, pain, neuropsychological problems, and the brain involvement that we've spoken about a lot today, the process of diagnosis, obstetrical issues, family planning issues, end of life counseling, um, and management. So it's a very broad guideline, and I, I don't know that we'll be able to cover <laughs> sorry, <coughs> everything today. But once we put together this 55-page manuscript and the Reader's Digest Quick Reference Guide uh, with the MDF, we wanted to turn to you to ask how can we best implement this so that we can get it into the hands of the people who will be taking care of you. And we had some, uh, a vision of what this could be like, and so I'm going to turn it over to our vignettes. Can I have my first round of actors come to the stage? You know, I've got an appointment with Dr. Bean tomorrow. Mm. I've never seen him before, and I think he's the new guy at the family care clinic. I, I think we should try out the clinic visit planner that we received at the MDF conference. I got the erasable pen that came with it so mm. we can make notes. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's take a look. Oh. There's a bunch of different symptoms area. Look, there's muscle weakness, and there's psychosocial issue, and there's thinking and behavior that we can make notes about. Any change or anything you want to tell Dr. Bean about, about your breathing? No, it's about the same as always. I, I do want to mention the issues I've been having with swallowing, though. I think they're getting worse. Oh, yeah. Let's write that down in the notes section on the back. I've been noticing also that you have been sitting around a lot more recently and not doing much of anything. I think you should tell Dr. Bean about this. I don't see this sitting around as a problem. You're the one on me all the time about this, and I don't see why. What does the MDF Quick Reference Guide have to say about fatigue? Oh, well, let's look at this. Uh, here it is. Okay. Oh, okay, well, okay, all right. 
we can ask Dr. Bean about activity. I, I do think I've lost some mobility lately, and yeah. stairs are definitely getting harder. Yeah, you can make notes of that as well. Uh, you've been asking your dad some question about the disease lately, and how it passed on to other people. Do you want to bring that up? Dr. Bean, may I want to refer you to a genetic counselor for those questions? I don't want to talk to a genetic counselor. They're probably just going to bring up something really awkward, like, like sex, that I definitely don't want to get into. Well, you can avoid the sex questions if you want. Uh, the geneticist is probably going to be the best person to talk about those topics. You shouldn't think about it. I am concerned that there are so many other topics that we, were, we are going to want to discuss with Dr. Bean, and I'm not sure how well we'll cover all of them in one visit. OK, OK. I'll, I'll think about it. Most of the things I want to bring up with Bean are already included in the clinic visit planner items we're supposed to bring up every year, see? Hmm. Yeah, this includes most of our topics, but I think you should be sure to bring up how much trouble you had lately with driving at night. Your vision seems to be getting fuzzier. Let's write that down on the back. Yeah, this will be handy because I always forget what I'm... <laughs> I wanted to ask by the time I get into the, into the exam room. Well, I know, but I do too. At least with the list, we'll be sure to get our key question and answers in the time Dr. Bing give us. So it's important to pull out your MDF clinic visit planner and review it and update it. Re pull out your visit planner, review it, update it with any new symptoms or changes or any questions that you have before you go to the doctor or care professional's office. That way you'll be prepared and will remember all your questions and comments. Bring any family members or others who are part of your care team to the visit if possible to make the visit as successful and as useful as possible. Hi, Dr. Bean. It's nice to meet you. I'm glad we're getting a chance to see you today because I have some questions about some of my symptoms. and. I've been anxious to talk to a doctor about them. I, I brought the myotonic dystrophy consensus-based care recommendations, quick reference guide <laughs> for you, because it includes many of the symptoms that I have, and I think it would help guide our conversation today. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, it's nice to meet you too. Um, I'm sorry, but I don't have time to review anything at today's appointment. Uh, we're pretty back up and I only have 15 minutes. Uh, I've seen a lot of patients though with myotonic dystrophy, so I think I'm up to speed with all aspects of the disease. We should be able to get through this pretty quickly. Well, we're glad that you have some experience with the disease, but I'd like to be sure that you have a look at the quick reference guideline recommendation. This was developed by 66 experienced DM1 clinicians and reflect the most current knowledge about symptoms management. <laughs> okay, well, I didn't know about some of those uh, annual recommendations. I'm not familiar with some of these symptom areas. This is actually pretty helpful. Can I keep this talking? Of course, absolutely. That's why we brought it. We have more, and you can download it from the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation website. There's also a longer version of the document with more information about many of the different symptoms. It will be great if you could look it over when you have more time. It's on the MDF website, too. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to get that. I mean, I didn't realize that the respiratory complications could be life-threatening. I'm not sure I'm comfortable as a family physician being in charge of your respiratory care. Well, should I see a respiratory specialist? Is, is there someone you'd recommend that I see? Uh, yes, there is someone over at the hospital who I think is really good. I'm going to write you a referral. Uh, I think you should take the quick reference guide or maybe the full document over to her. Um, it would probably be really helpful. I'll do that. Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation is also publishing consensus-based respiratory care guidelines for myotonic dystrophy type 1. I'll make sure she gets a copy of those once they're published. Okay. 
Um, so your family doctor and some of your specialists might not see a lot of myotonic dystrophy patients, and they might not know important information about the disease. So the quick reference guide is a great way for them to learn. So it's important to share it with your care providers and ensure that they understand how important the guide is in improving the quality of care that myotonic dystrophy patients receive, not only you but others. So you should have all received copies in your conference bag and you can download it from the website. So also remember that it's important to ask to see a specialist if you feel that your regular doctor doesn't have enough information about some of your symptoms. So remember that you and your caregivers and your family members are knowledgeable about myotonic dystrophy. Sometimes you know more than your healthcare professionals. Be assertive. Don't hesitate to share what you know about myotonic dystrophy and ask for what you need. By handing out the quick reference guide and sharing your disease knowledge, you are training the next generation of clinicians to treat myotonic dystrophy. Dr. Tyler, I'd like to use the rest of this visit to ask you some questions about my symptoms and about the disease. I've brought my MDF clinic planner. This is my checklist for clinic visits, and I'd like to discuss the topics listed on it, as well as some questions I have written on the back, and I hope that we can... Right, thanks. We're going to have to wrap this up. We know that our myotonic dystrophy professionals don't do this, but some of our community members have experienced being cut off or not being listened to by clinicians. So if this happens to you, be sure you do what our patient today is going to do and advocate for yourself. This is your appointment and you should feel comfortable asking for what you need. I, I know that you're busy, Dr. Tyler, but I have some important questions that I need to get answered, starting with issues I'm having with weakness in my lower legs. I'm concerned that they're getting worse. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to have to take this up at another appointment. Unfortunately, I'm out of time, and I've got to get to. I, I'd like to finish my comment. I was talking about the fact that I'm concerned that my foot drop issues are getting worse. I don't want to start falling, and I'd like to get this looked at. I made a point of listing this issue on my clinic planner because I'm pretty concerned, and I want to discuss this today. OK, let's discuss your symptoms. Tell me, what changes have you been experiencing? <laughs> All right, you should hear from Dr. Baskett's office about the referral to a physical therapist who can help with some exercises and possibly a brace. If you feel free to call my office if you don't, and my staff will follow up. Thanks for coming in today. It's good to see you. We have a number of uh, remaining questions that we really want to get answered today. If this is uh, all the time we have, we'd like to schedule a follow-up visit to address the rest of our concerns at another time. Again, some doctors may interrupt you, and you might have a hard time getting your points across. Um, they may try to force you into yes or no answers. They might try to rush you through clinical uh, checklists. Your clinic visit might be only 15 minutes, but um, it's important to persevere. Um, refer to the questions and concerns that you wrote down on the clinic visit planner and request that the doctor not interrupt you, rush you, or cut you off. If you can't get all your issues addressed in one visit, be sure to request another appointment. So you have the right to quality care and you have the right to adequate time with your provider. Welcome to the cardiology clinic. I think this is your first visit, correct? Let's see. You have myotonic dystrophy, right? I have myotonic dystrophy. It's a neuromuscular disease with a lot of different symptoms, including cardiac symptoms that can be life-threatening. I've brought a quick reference guide of published care recommendations for myotonic dystrophy. It's a shortened version of a more detailed document that helps clinicians understand DM symptoms and how to treat them. Okay, these seem pretty informative. I wasn't aware that cardiac 
conduction issues are part of this disease. You said there's a longer version with more information on the cardiac symptoms? The Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation published a comprehensive document with care recommendations for many different symptoms. It is also publishing a specific set of cardiac care recommendations for cardiologists. I'd like to get you a copy of those too. We're pretty worried about how quickly her heart issues have gotten worse. Okay, good. I'd really like to see the full document. It's available on the MDF website? Sure is. Okay, I'll check online later. I'd also like to share this with some of the doctors in gastroenterology and pulmonology so that they know about this resource too. Do you have another copy of this guide? Yes, I do. <laughs> so I'm glad you suggested sharing this with some of the other specialists at the hospital. I'm actually, I need to build my care team and would appreciate your recommendations would appreciate your recommendations regarding other specialists I should see. Right now, I need a referral to an orthopedic surgeon because my primary care doctor says I need to have knee surgery. Can you recommend someone who is knowledgeable about DM or open to learning more about the disease? And I also don't have a good pulmonologist. Can you help? Yes. I've got someone in mind, a pulmonologist as well as an orthopedist. They're both very good. In addition, I think meeting with an anesthesiologist would be critical. That is the top item on the QRG guide. Who is going to be taking care of you after the surgery? Do you have family members or others who can care for you who won't be at work during the day? Yes, I'll be taking time off of work while she recovers from surgery. We should be all set. Okay, great. Thanks for coming in today, and good luck with the surgery. Thanks. So your neurologist or primary care provider may not know enough about all aspects of the disease to care for you effectively. Be sure to share the quick reference guide so that he or she understands all the key areas that need to be addressed regularly. And don't forget that you need a care team made up of professionals in different medical specialties, including possibly physical therapy, occupational therapy, and others. So ask for referrals to the specialists and other care professionals that you need. Remember, you are a knowledgeable resource about this disease, and you need to be assertive and ensure that you ask for and get the care that you need. So this is just to provoke conversation and thought because what we wanted to do was to see what your vision is for how we can implement these care guidelines so we can build a community of physicians who are knowledgeable about myotonic dystrophy. So we're going to start walking around with microphones to start getting input from everybody in the audience. Also, please give us a round of applause for our actors. Anyone have any first thoughts? How would, how would, how would you, I'm just gonna ask, how would you approach your physician with these care guidelines? Do you have any thoughts about starting that conversation? Hi, I'm, I'm Carolyn Valak, I'm a caregiver, and the way I would start that conversation, and the way I have, is sometimes I have all these research documents, you know, abstracts, and I have them on hard copy, and I give them to the medical assistant at the beginning of the appointment. So the doctor can, in the privacy of the hallway, can review it more thoroughly if he wants to, if they want to. So I find that they're more likely to look at it because then they're acquainted with, with what, 
I had to say it, and I try to give the heads up to the medical assistant what I want to talk about. So that's also helpful. That seems a good approach. Great. Hi. I just thought if you passed out the wigs, we could get more attention from our doctors. <laughs> oh. I'm also going to ask you to just say your name and where you're from. Hi guys, my name is Carrie Wenzel and I am from Longmont, Colorado. I am a caregiver. And one of the ways I would implement this um, with our doctors is we have an online patient portal where we can send in messages or information at any time. And so if you uploaded this information and sent it ahead of time, they could add it to your file, they could have it for the office, and you could get the information bef to them before you go to your appointment. So that's what I would do. That's great. The other beauty, I don't know about other institutions, but at our institution, the online portal goes to our whole team. So if it's a question that our nurse or our social worker is better suited to answer, we can get that routed to that particular person on the care team. So it's a good way to kind of ask a question of a group, at least with our system. I'm David Herbert. I would echo the idea of sending an online version. If you have a portal through your medical center, great. If you have an email, but then double down on that and bring a hard copy. And the email serve as a formal transmission to the medical system as well, so they'll have that. So if you get into a meeting with your physician and they try and blow you off or something, it, that's there and you can come back at it later. Uh, hi. My name's Sarah Wayne, I'm from the United Kingdom, and I'm mum to a seven-year-old little boy who I adopted called Josh, who has congenital myotonic dystrophy. Um, I'm also a paediatric nurse, so when I go back, I will be emailing all the neuromuscular specialists in the UK and the neuromuscular nurse advisors uh, with this information in the hope that we can get it out there. I think in the UK, certainly the experiences that I've had taking Josh to see specialists, um, they've been very unwilling to listen to anything that's said really about the condition. Particularly difficult is um, the anaesthetic aspect of it and their reluctance to be told by a nurse or a parent that um, we've got information that they really need to be reading. So I'll be spending a considerable amount of time when I get back to work bombarding them all with this information. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eileen. I'm from Memphis. Um, I have uh, taken the whole toolkit with me to doctors. And a lot of the experience that I've had is they become overwhelmed and, or else they won't look at it. And I've even been told by a, one of my primary care doctors that she said, I'm just overwhelmed. And she referred to this as MS two times after I corrected her. And then she left the, the office and came back and collected herself. So I think that something like um, this, a, uh, a smaller version of it, and also uh, emailing ahead of time if you have patient portals is a really good step. And, um, um, and advocating, I, keep, I mean, I've been through several doctors and I've finally gotten to where um, doctors that will listen and I have to continue to advocate over and over and over. Um, so uh, that's been my experience, and this is, seems, it really seems like a really helpful step. Hi, I'm, I'm Jeremy Kelly. I, I'd like to actually give an example. Um, you know, with, with these guidelines that we have, uh, we've had the anesthesia guidelines. And we had an experience with our son where he needed to get an earplug put in and he, he needed to have anesthesia. And my wife, with the guidelines that 
the foundation has had for you know the last eight plus years. Um, we went, got there seven o'clock in the morning, and just like the scene that was acted out here, we turn round and in comes the anesthesiologist. You know, we'd have to get Jack up at 5:30 in the morning for all of us to get there. And we look the guy in the eye and it's like, you know, have you read about myotonic dystrophy and what it does with anesthesia? And, it, it, you know, Jack's now a lot older, but it kind of reminded me when you ask someone they haven't done their homework, it was like this look on his face that we were calling him out and he was either going to bullshit us or he was going to fess up. And we just turned around and we're like, you know, you're, you're about to take our son into surgery with anesthesia. We're leaving. And we got up. And, you know, number one, you basically you've got to call out these doctors. They have huge egos. I mean, they're wonderful people, but they have huge egos. And if they haven't done their homework, you, everyone here needs to call them out. And what's so exciting about these new guidelines is it's empowering you. Before we gave you the, the, the toolkit around anesthesia, now we've got all the other aspects of your care. And if, you know, going back to what was played out on the the stage, if you're not comfortable, turn around and say, this isn't acceptable. And, and either the doctor's then going to turn around and say, okay, let me do the homework. And I think the great idea to make the doctor look good, giving it to their assistant beforehand, you know, kind of gives them the heads up of what's coming their way. But, you know, the, the other issue then is if you're not comfortable, don't go back to that doctor. Go to the foundation, find out who within the area is d dealing with similar issues and try and figure out a way around it. So, but anyway, thank you. I think these are great. So one thing I wanted to pose to the audience is a question. So Carolyn described how she prepared for her visits by finding research articles to give in advance to her medical assistant of her doctor. I wanted to ask other people, how do you prepare for your clinic visits? What do you do in advance? Um, what kind of conversations do you have or materials you gather? What, how, do, how do you get ready? And then we have one here. Hmm? Oh, sorry. This is quick, but I think it's really helpful to always bring someone with you, whether it's your spouse, whether it's a friend. And if you write out the questions before and share them with your friend or who, whoever's with you, and tell them, because I'll often not want to waste the doctor's time. I'll say, okay, that's fine, that's fine. But tell your friend to go back and make sure that you get all the questions answered. That's really helpful. Excellent. Okay. So my name is Belen Esparis, and I am a physician. So I'm one of those, how do you call them? <laughs> yes. I mean, no one really likes to be told how to do their job, and that, that's, that's actually how I start the conversation when I go and see a physician uh, with my daughter. And I'm aware that it's a rare disease, and I don't blame them for not having the experience. And, but I know more than them in most cases about, you know, the condition and all the different consequences in the different organ systems. Um, I do want to stress that, you know, with the anesthesia issue is super important. My daughter had to have a procedure to have a loop recorder implanted four years ago, and it required anesthesia. I called the anesthesiologist, I spoke to her on the phone, told her about the anesthesia guidelines. She said, yes, I'll read them, I'm aware, we've done cases of patients with this condition. My daughter had the procedure done and it took more than two hours to wake up and in the recovery room, the nurse was looking at the TV and not monitoring her. She had to have that same device replaced this June, this year, a few months ago, and my major concern was what's going to happen this time with the anesthesia. So I made, again, my homework. I called the anesthesiologist two weeks in advance, spoke to her, ask her to please go back to her medical records and see how much medication, what kind of medication she got the prior <coughs> procedure. She was kind enough to give me her email. I emailed the anesthesia guidelines to her. And then the day before the procedure, I called her and made sure she was on top of it. 
the day of the procedure, I spoke to her, and she said, honestly, after reading this, I don't even want to give anesthesia to, to your daughter. Do we really need to do this? But after the procedure, this time my daughter woke up right away, and when I talked to her, she had given her 80% less of the dose that was supposed to get by height and weight. So this is very important because this time my daughter was awake immediately after the procedure and the recovery was completely, I mean, it was much better than before. So my husband is not a physician and sometimes he's, he, he thinks that I'm a, I get a little feisty when we go to doctors. Um, and that's okay, we have different personalities. But what I'm trying to stress is that we are the best advocates for our family members and, and, the, and we should not only be strong when we think something is not going to you know, turn out the way it should and also try to teach them how to self-advocate for themselves. So I usually take those opportunities to tell my daughter, listen, when they tell you that, the, you know, that they're going to take this out and not put it back in, you need to think. You know, why are they doing this? Is it, is it appropriate, not appropriate? And so that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> uh, my name is David Kugler. I just wanted to add that, uh, at least for me, sometimes I don't understand all the details, but I think it's important, one, to really bring all the documentation to the doctors and if one doesn't feel comfortable that they know what they read them or they know what they're doing or they're really on top of it, I, I much rather, you know, walk away from the procedure or from the, from the appointment and schedule it for another time when the doctor or the team of doctors really knows that rather than going with it and then finding out later that, you know, somebody didn't, didn't read what they were supposed to read. So I, I think we're hearing from multiple people how important it is to prepare before a procedure or a surgery. Um, prepare yourself, but particularly prepare your doctor, but also the anesthesiologist. Um, so I think that that's definitely a theme. The thing I also wanted to ask is how do you prepare for just a routine clinic visit? What do you do? So my name's Alan Lehman. Um, I'm a caregiver for my wife. We come from Chesterton, Indiana. Um, we are very fortunate with our primary care physician. He is one that values learning about different things. We, when we saw him last time before coming to the conference, we told him that we were coming here, and his comment to us was, get as much information for me as you can. I want to read everything that you have. And to go back before, so what we do is um, we always have a list of current medications. Um, I'm a big tech person being a teacher, so we use a lot of Google apps. So I have Google Docs and Google Drive downloaded on my phone. So as soon as they get there, it's like they start asking questions. I'm like, here, read the list. I hand them my phone. Here's the list. I also, we also have uh, my chart, so I can forward them things using that with uh, messages to the providers. And if not, I play bad cop really well. I'm a high school math teacher. I get crap dished at me all day long. So I'm really good at dishing it right back. And there are times where... My wife was a former medical assistant in a very busy health clinic, so she dealt with a lot of people like me, and she'll be like, be nice to the doctor. Why are you talking that way? Um, excuse me, they're not answering my question, and they're obviously trying to do something they're not familiar with, so we're going to get it taken care of, or we're going to move on .org. That's a good point. My name's Paula Bauck, and I'm from Illinois, and we're working on a heart procedure for my son right now, and it's not the doctor, it's the anesthesiologist. And I know you wanted to know more about what we take. This has been the most disheartening experience of my life because one of the other psychologists, no, neurologists, has told my son that under anesthetic, there's this 50-50 chance 
that you won't come out of the coma. And when in, and we did in our hospital, and it's a big hospital, a big one in Chicago. We can't. We don't know who our anesthesiologist is going to be because they rotate, so we can't talk to anybody in particular, and we can my chart them, but you don't know. And that particular anesthesiologist who's on call that day is going to be responsible for more than than my family member, and so I don't. I don't have any way of. but he did have a big ego. And he said, the person that wrote this, who happens to be from Stanford, Dr. Day, he wasn't an, an anesthesiologist. He's only a neurologist. What does he know about it? And if Dr. Day's in the room, I apologize, but good, he's not here. That's great. <laughs> but the point is, this has been the most exasperating, annoying, and I teach school too, so I take a bunch of crap, but you can't dish it out to some people because they just don't even hear you. So when you're going to have surgery, it's the most, taking the paperwork with you doesn't necessarily help because he said, we'll give it to the anesthesiologist that morning. That, on the top paragraph, it says, they need this in advance, not the morning of. So search if you want your loved one to come out of the coma. Good points. I hope you could all hear that. Very good points. Hello, Dr. Jacinda. I love you. Um, in fact, I, I have to say something about Dr. Jacinda and related to anesthesia. My daughter, she's 36. She was having surgery, and to many of the same points that keep being repeated here, she tried to self-advocate, but she has some cognitive issues. She doesn't always communicate in a manner that's effective, and doctors tend to not respect her or listen to her. She did present them with the MDF guidelines pre-surgery. I was not there. They would not speak with me. <clears throat> and so she asked that they would be placed in the file, et cetera, et cetera, because she didn't know how to articulate any of the information but emphasize it, the necessity of reading it and preparing accordingly. Of course, back to the other woman's point, rotation of anesthesiologists, day of surgery. I was there and <laughs> wasn't even in the file. The, the person on deck, um, she was fabulous, thank God. And she actually tried to call Jacinda, who was, I'm not worthy, she's amazing. She, she was willing to just have a conversation with this person and emphasize the importance of these protocols. It's life and death, right? So this anesthesiologist was amazing. She actually did converse with me and she changed the entire approach right there, right before the surgery. She went down the list and she checked, oh, oh, I was gonna do that, I'm not doing that, so I'll do this, all the way down the list and my daughter had a very successful surgery. So all of that, but the, the main thing is you really have to know how to develop your team. And if you go in and somebody treats you like the guy on the stage, first thing I thought was fired you know, you're gone. And you, you go and you find someone who will either be teachable or knowledgeable already. And then from there, you develop a team and have that person hopefully spear, spearhead it for you and or find a case manager. It depends on where you are, obviously. But if you can be in an uh, interdisciplinary clinic where they already have a base of knowledge, all the better, and have it dispersed that way. But you got to find that one person that's trustworthy that will follow through, that is teachable if they don't know, and will put the information in the file, whether it be for a surgery or regular clinic visits, and disperse that information accordingly to all the people that they refer to. And sorry, my soapbox is over, but <laughs> you, you do. You have to be strong. And it's, it's, it's a shame because the comment about Dr. Day just being a neurologist, give me a break. <laughs> I'm going to bite my tongue off right now. It's, it's the people that put their blood, sweat, tears, and time into these toolkits, it's, it's life-saving information. And if a doctor is not willing to listen to it, if they don't know and be teachable, it's time to move on and find another doctor.
Hi, I'm sorry. It's one more quick point on anesthetics again. So my sister, who I was caring for, needed to go to the emergency room and needed surgery. And I told the doctors, you need to wait until I get there. And I went there with the guidelines and said, I have to talk to the doctor and the anesthesiologist. They both saw them. And she went into surgery, and then I waited for her to come out. And I waited, and I kept asking to go in, and I kept waiting, and finally they let me in. And my point is, it's the post-care after anesthesia that's absolutely as important as the care, as the anesthetic they use. I went in, and Sheila's head was back, and she was choking, and it was a disaster. And I said, where's the doctor? And they said they both left right after the surgery. And the nurse didn't know anything, so Sheila went into the ICU for 12 days and almost died. Just so, so my point is just, it's not just the anesthetic they use. And Dr. Day sometimes says, you might suggest going, having the, having the patient go to the ICU directly afterwards if it's a big surgery. Like go, go observe them there. Because really, I think it's the 24 hours afterwards that are just as important as what they use. So. Exactly. So just to, just to follow up on that, that is in the care guidelines, that things that are routinely outpatient or go home right after, may be something that you need to stay overnight for. And that's why that pre-anesthesiology assessment or pre-operative assessment is such an important visit. Hi. Um, my daughter, I have four children. Two we tested. Thank God they don't have it. Uh, my wife has uh, DM1. And my other two kids at the time, they don't want to get tested. Now my son wants to get tested. My daughter doesn't. And she had minor surgery a couple of years ago. And we, when it comes to surgery, sometimes you want to have it in the hospital because of golf, but anything happens. But this was in the office. And we made sure to give them the guidelines. And we said, there's DM1 myotonic dystrophy in the family. Please check this out. And they went through everything A to Z, which was great because they were very on top of it. Uh, many years ago, my wife did a minor surgery, minor major surgery, nothing crazy. And we made sure to speak to the, and it was in uh, Roosevelt, Luke, uh, Roosevelt Hospital, major hospital in New York City. We made sure that the guidelines that we got from the myotonic dystrophy went straight to the chief of anesthesia. Because we said the only way to get this done is, like you said, there's a rotation all day long. But once it's in the file, and I made sure that the chief got it, I got a confirmation, I spoke to them, he got it, now there's no excuses that the doctor saw it, didn't see it, and of course, as we're coming up to the surgeries, the doctor has to be aware as well, because he's putting his reputation on the line to do this. But if you, anyone needs to go under surgery, you must, must give it to the chief of anesthesia. There's no excuses. They're on top of the doctors, and whoever's on the rotation, they're going to bring it to their attention. And that's the only way you're going to get things done. Go to the top. And that's really where it has to be. Good idea. Sorry to pile on in the anesthesiology guidelines, but it, it's a, one of the highest risk areas. So sort of keying off a few of these things and having been through, I think, four surgeries now with my daughters, uh, as well as uh, one of my daughters having two children that don't have myotonic dystrophy. She went through the in vitro fertilization loop successfully, and there are all sorts of questions about blocks and all sorts of other questions. She had C-sections, so that they're, oh, we generally do general anesthesia, but there are options. But just a few tips, it, you know, if you can go to the top, great, but one tip is don't assume that one push of information to the doctor or the health system equals everyone in that system now is knowledgeable. Uh, I prefer to overdo it, and so when we met with their surgeons eight weeks before, we pushed the anesthesiology guidelines to them. When we met with the anesthesiologist, we gave them the guidelines. We came in the day of surgery with extra guidelines because surgical teams and, and clinical teams are rotating all the time and stuff happens. The surgeon you're going to have is tied up all day. You now have the other partner. Here are their guidelines, so give them to them again. And one thing that we've done is, not that I want to be translating whether they got it or not, but one way to kind of suss it out is to say, what are you going to change in my daughter's anesthesiology plan based on what you've read? And if they say, 
nothing, this, this is wrong. But we had one doctor argue with us, go back, they clearly had read all of it, and there was sort of a 50-50 eh, question, and I got the sense that they'd read it. But you can tell pretty quickly if they're just pushing you away, haven't done their homework, or have read it, and then the best is when they say, yeah, based on this, I'm gonna use this drug instead of that drug. I'm gonna key on post-anesthesiology. So those are just a few tips. Um, I'm David Rye. I'm a neurologist and a sleep specialist and enjoying myself and hearing from the audience and just wanted to comment about a couple of issues. Um, and I'm very interested in this uh, now. I've become very interested and great to hear all the comments. The anesthesia one is, is very interesting. And just as a physician that cares for sleep patients and myotonic dystrophy patients and all sorts of other rare disorders, rare disorders are tough for physicians, uh, especially primary care. I think we've heard that here. And especially, I, I echo your comments and many others, is, you know, don't get too hard on them sometimes because it, it, be an advocate. And it, it is a tough time in medicine now because there's a lot of handoffs got to be careful uh, as being a consumer with the family recently. There, there are different physicians and different levels of knowledge once those handoffs occur. And every time you hand off a football, you can fumble it, right? So those are very critical points in time. The main issue, though, as a researcher, also a PhD and a researcher, is that Hopefully we get to a point with your community and the hypersomnia community that we learn why anesthesia is, why patients are more sensitive to anesthesia so that it becomes routine knowledge. And, and, and we don't have to be, you know, I mean, wouldn't it be great if it was just accepted, right? So these physicians that are getting these, it's great that you guys do uh, put together this, this um, consensus uh, opinion. We're doing the same for the Hypersomnia Foundation. Some of these patients have, a, our patients have a similar issue with anesthesia. But, you know, a lot of the physicians now, including myself, when patients come to us and they say, well, look at this. It's great if you have the time, right? I mean, that's, that's always an issue. Um, but also the, the, the phenomenology that a lot, of, a lot of patients come with a lot of information because we're saturated with so much information, it's very difficult to be a consumer on the physician side as well. So I don't, I'm critical of physicians as well. I'm, I'm one of them. <laughs> so, and, and I'm hoping, thank you. And I think that pass off point is a good point, which brings me back to Jeremy's point of of repetitively giving information once is not enough. Um, and uh, because it might be a new team, a new shift, the, the post-care team is a different care team than the operative team. And so don't be afraid to repeat yourself. Um, it, uh, it never, it, 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 you can never say it too much. Um, so. We've experienced the other side of anesthesia. Um, our family, I've noticed that I can only take a child's portion of the anesthesia, not the majority of, of what you take. But um, we, I went in for an emergency appendectomy two years ago, and Anne was there. I take her with me all the time. And we had Achisawa's list that said what we can and can't take. And the anesthesiologist came in and talked to us. And they says, oh, no, we're not going to use this. We're not going to use this. We're not going to use this. And they gave me what they were going to give me. And I won't even tell you what it was called. But um, they thought I'd wake up in about four hours. It was about 12 hours before they'd let me out of the hospital. Because my sats were down. My oxygen was down to 70s and, uh, and low, low 70s. And uh, the next week or two, we had a visit with our neurologist. And she says, if that happens to you, you have them call me and we'll find you a bed up here at the neurological center and we'll bill them. But um, <laughs> we, she didn't say that. I don't remember you saying that. Oh, 
we, we have had three sons in the last year or two that have had pacemakers placed with lidocaine. So I don't know if that's typical, but, uh, and I've had bone marrow biopsies done with lidocaine. The first one I did, the doctor says, usually we knock the person out. I'm not used to doing this to the person that's awake. And he says, they usually don't talk to me when they're on the bed. I says, I'll be quiet. So, but um, yeah, I would advocate what they have in here and, and use that for your, any procedures you have. Thank you. So, I think uh, you're Jacinda? Pointing, yeah. Can I talk? Yeah, I have a microphone. Hi, I'm uh, Glenn Wiggins. I have DM1 half an hour ago as a cardiologist on stage, but I'm actually a uh, retired uh, medical oncologist. And uh, I had an experience uh, that kind of reinforces a little bit of what the previous speaker said as far as the sensitivity to narcotics that patients with DM have. Um, I had a hip replacement and I told them that I did not want to have general anesthesia. I met with the anesthesiologist. Fortunately, I forced ourselves to meet with them ahead of time, and they gave me intraspinal uh, duramorph, which is a long-acting morphine. And surgery went fine. I'm up ambulating a few hours later. Then about eight hours after surgery, I'm as my wife would say, I was OTL, out to lunch completely. <laughs> and, uh, and very scary, I, I didn't know what was the matter, uh, and um, didn't, know didn't know where I was, thought I had cancer to the brain, uh, and um, I was like that for probably 12 hours. and. Um, Finally, it wore off, and they ended up having a neurologist come to see me and doing CAT scans of the brain and of the chest to make sure I didn't have blood clots. But uh, the long and short of it was that extreme sensitivity to the morphine. Uh, in fact, the neurologist probably shouldn't have told me this, but he said the anesthesiologist gave you higher than the recommended dose for this duramorph. Uh, and it was, it was a very scary experience, but the point being that narcot not only the anesthet anesthetics, but narcotics in general, patients with DM are very sensitive to. Exactly, so it's not just the anesthesia, but the pain management afterwards. And it's not just the anesthesia putting you to sleep, it's the anesthesia putting your breathing drive to sleep and when that wakes up are important in your post-operative care. So, right Hi, I am Lori Gutman. I'm one of the neurologists who uh, was wearing a blue wig a few minutes ago. And um, I, I just wanted to talk about the guidelines and how important they are for me for training physicians who will in the future take care of all of us. Um, but the, the guidelines, I, you know, with the electronic records, you can pre-populate a note to a patient. And I've used these guidelines to put into the note, if I send my resident in to meet with a patient, I say, you have to ask about each of these things and make sure that you address them for a patient who has myotonic dystrophy. And I don't want you to come back in to, to talk to me about it until you've addressed it. And so I think one of the things that the guidelines can do for medical education is hopefully inform people more about this is a multi-system disease. It's not just a muscle disease and that you can't just focus on the weakness part, that there's all these other things to ask about. And I've had medical students say to me, I had no idea you know, after they came out of the room from talking with a patient. I just think these guidelines can be really important and that you shouldn't be afraid to give them to a physician. I don't care how big our egos are. <laughs> you shouldn't be afraid to give it to us. And from, and from the blonde girl on the stage. Uh, just to reflect back also of the international perspective of those guidelines, uh, because they were made from an international consensus and not the next step, because yes, Molly, there's a next step.
it will be to translate those guidelines into multiple languages so we can give them to other uh, general practitioner. And just to reflect back, one of the drawbacks of the Canadian public system, there is drawback to the public system, is that you don't have the right to choose your GP. So if you don't like him, you're, you need to opt out. So you, you're without a GP and you're putting on a waiting list that is, is between one year and two years of waiting. And then you're, you're, and the neurologist is the same. So you don't have the right to choose your clinic. You're, allotted to a GP. So those are very important because we don't have a choice to, wa to walk and turn our back. We need to educate those GP and our patient needs to do that. So different perspective, but they will also be important in every country with probably different modifications, but very small. So it's, a, it's an amazing job that has been done by the MDF because it's not going to only help U.S. patients, but all over like the the person from the UK said, I think it's a great achievement. And I think we should have a round of applause for MDF. They work very hard. You were talking about one doctor's ego. Imagine 66 doctors' ego and researcher and big names in a room trying to discuss this. You know, it's a nightmare, I'm sure. The, the other thing I wanted to say is, you know, when you brought up the what's coming down the pike, what's next, is for myotonic dystrophy type 2, you all, all are next for the care guidelines as well as congenital. These are, these are the next congenital myotonic dystrophy. These are also guidelines that are going to be developed and available. Watch this space in the future. I also wanted to call your attention in your bags of the bracelets all have a little stamp on it, not only stating the diagnosis, but the website in the anesthesia guidelines notice. And I was just asked to remind people that in an emergency situation, your EMT needs to know just as much as a surgeon or an anesthesiologist. And either that bracelet or the app on your phone with medical information, a medical alert pendant bracelet, something in your wallet behind your insurance card that says, I have myotonic dystrophy, your medication list, all can be life-saving if you are in a car accident, struck by lightning, abducted by aliens, whatever reason brought you in the emergency room. If you can't talk for yourself, something's got to talk for you. And so that's something that, you know, I, I, I think is really important. But I know we don't have a whole lot of time left in the discussion, but one thing I wanted to ask is, for all, all of you guys, what strategies do you have when you know your visit is only 15 minutes long? How do you use that time efficiently to make yourself heard, to get things covered that you need done? You know, what are, what are some strategies for using that, that time in the clinic to, um, to cover all of these topics? We've spent most of this time talking about anesthesia and surgery, which is a very, very important topic, but I just wanna make sure that we talk some about how we're going to use these guidelines in, in our just ordinary, everyday clinic. Okay, to address your question, how to uh, use your doctor's time wisely, uh, I have a few suggestions. One is to kill them with kindness. Make sure they like you. Um, number two is sound smarter than you are, because then they'll respect you, maybe. And number three is, um, like in the skit of, of before, when the doctor was interrupting, you interrupt. And don't let them go without answering your question. I'm a very stubborn person, so I've been able to do these things. But um, like they were saying, you have to be really strong and assertive. And just don't let them leave. Excuse me, you didn't answer my question. Uh, no, I really need to, excuse me, you know, just get your answers. Because it's so hard sometimes with some of these people. And I have... One time, I'll give an example. I gave the toolkit to my uh, ophthalmologist, and he took it, looked at the cover, and put it on the counter. I never went back to him because he wasn't going to read. So you just have, I'm a little petite person, and I'm a girl, and I'm blonde and everything, but I can get through to these doctors, so I know you can too. You just got to believe in yourself, be strong, and don't let them leave until you're done. Hi, it's me again. Um, because I feel like I've had to advocate so much for myself, I think that one of the good ways to do it is to um, say, 
you know, I appreciate all of your training, and I know uh, that you're very knowledgeable, but this is a rare disease, and I know that it's not, the information is not really uh, prevalent, so would you be open to learning about this? And um, kind of, you know, play up to their ego sometimes, and like, like she said, kill them with kindness, and and be respectful from, from where they're coming from. And um, that, to me, has worked a lot better than being really mad and, you know, angry and just, and, and then keep asking the questions and, you know, over and over and saying, is there any way I can get this information to you that will be better for you? And um, telling them what you know, too, about it. So that's what's been helpful for me. Just a quick question. Did, did you infer before that lidocaine is one of the safe drugs to use when you want to have a very light anesthesia? And in particular, is that okay for a young child who's three or four years old who's having some sort of a dental surgery? And that, that's just my question. Was that directed to me or to no, the room at large? Any, So, sure, it's 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 safer than other alternatives, but I've heard of people having some reactions to it. So there's no drug that you give without monitoring, um, and so I think it's uh, it's certainly uh, one of the tools that's available to the anesthesiologist. Well, the, It, it is part of one of the things that they would normally use as well. So I'm not sure. Yeah. It's, and, it, and we cover it in the anesthesiology guidelines. So. so I just have something to say. I had a uh, colonoscopy about two months ago, and I asked the, uh, my gastroenterologist. They don't usually have an anesthesiologist for that procedure. But I asked him and told him, and he uh, he actually told you know had an anesthesiologist there to monitor the procedure and, and afterwards. So you know I don't know because they usually don't for that procedure. I wasn't totally out of it. You know it was. Uh, and did they watch you longer after the procedure? He monitored the procedure and and a little bit after that. I was uh I woke up after he left, but yeah, he was there for the whole procedure. So the same procedure, he said, or do you uh, it's awake, or do not? No, I just awake. Mm -hmm. I just one one final comment. It the anesthesia, that's life and death. And we've, we've heard doing the right thing. Obviously, we want to go down that path. But what I'm really excited about all these guidelines across all the other symptoms is it, it, it's not life and death, but it's getting a tremendously better outcome of your visit to the doctor. So I hope the, the conversation, we spent a, a lot of time talking about anesthetics, but it's actually all the other symptoms that we're dealing with as families if you can go in there and use these guidelines and get the best outcome, it's going to dramatically improve the quality of, of your life. And, you know, I just, it's great the whole conversation around anesthesia, but all of this work has been done across all the other symptoms that we're dealing with. So, you know, if you can take the, what we've learned from the anesthesia guidelines, which we've had from, you know, the last 10 years, and then now translate that across all the other aspects of the disease, I, we, we're going to be as a community in a lot better position. And, and I think that, you know, sometimes your specialist might only have 15 minutes for your clinic visit, and maybe 10 of that was taken up with the MA putting you in the room and getting your vital signs. So, so how do we use the time that we have? And are there ways before or after the visit to make sure we cover everything or to get another visit to follow up on things? 
because I think because this is a multi-systemic disease, you know, deciding what is the top of my list, um, how can I, you know, move directly to the chief problem that I'm having right now, making sure that there aren't things that perpetually fall off the list because there isn't enough time, like the genetic counseling question or how exactly is this causing my disease, um, some of these things can be answered by non-physicians who are part of the team and to make sure that you're using everybody on the team to get the answers that you need. Is it, is it social work to ask about an IEP or about disability or family medical leave for your loved one who's taking time off for your surgery? Um, is it the genetic counselor who can ask, answer some questions about inheritance or age of onset or in vitro fertilization, uh, pre-implantation genetic testing? Even if you aren't the one, you, if you, you're not planning on getting pregnant, if it's just something you want to know about, you know, sometimes you can find someone else on the t care team to also answer your questions for you. Okay, hi. Um, just, just a couple comments. Some things that I do when I see a doctor for the first time. Want to call? Okay, hello, hello. <laughs> okay. Um, some of the things that I would do when seeing a doctor for the first time is just make them aware that um, myotonic dystrophy is a rare disorder. And um, I would bring in some information about the disease, and what I've done at times is highlight what's pertinent to my daughter that they really need to pay attention to. I always tell them about the myotonic website, and I've even had some doctors go out and look at it, which is wonderful. Um, and, and the other thing, I, I think that we do have to appreciate and respect each other, but I think it has to go both ways. Not only us respecting the doctor and their time, which was mentioned, we're, we're very busy too as a caregiver of a child or family member of a, someone with myotonic dystrophy, and we're there trying to make sure that everything is okay for them. And I think that, in general, a lot of physicians do feel that they're too busy to listen to what we have to say, and I hope that there's a way, I know that MDF has a program about educating doctors, I hope there's a way to explain to them that even though they're an expert in their field, we're an expert on our child or our family member, and we know what's been going on with them and what experiences we've had, and that's valuable information to them, particularly if it's involving a surgical situation with anesthesia. So. Um, I have a question to, to you, okay. as well as any neurologist or doctors. Being that myotonic dystrophy is a form of a muscular dystrophy, is there, when it comes to surgeries and anesthesia, do, other than myotonic dystrophy, DM1, DM2, are they, the, the, the muscular dystrophy patients that go under surgery, are they under the same guidelines as myotonic dystrophy? And if so, why don't they somehow advocate and try and get the anesthesia into the guidelines and the teachings from the beginning of whoever's going to school to become an anesthesiologist and why not have it part of their curriculum? I think that's a really good question, and, and in some ways it is but not necessarily relating to myotonic dystrophy. So when anesthesiologists go through their residency, one topic that's emphasized are a type of muscular dystrophy and another inherited disorder that cause something called malignant hyperthermia, which is a life-threatening complication of certain forms of anesthesia. It often, people graduate often with the impression that that's the only thing that muscular dystrophy causes with anesthesia. Now, in uh, other neuromuscular disorders that don't have malignant hyperthermia risk, the risks are similar in certain ways with myotonic dystrophy, but with more in myotonic dystrophy. So if there's an effect on breathing and swallowing, those things have a lot of overlap. Now, if there's cardiac involvement in that other muscular dystrophy, like myotonic dystrophy, with a risk of arrhythmia, there is overlap. But one of the things that's unique about myotonic dystrophy is this sensitivity to sedating medications and opiates. 
as far as alertness about your waking up your drive to breathe, as well as your GI tract deciding that the opiates are gonna make it just stop for a while, um, and a number of other issues, particularly swallowing and being able to cough and clear your throat effectively. So I think of explaining to, when I get an anesthesiologist on the phone, I say it is not a malignant hyperthermia risk. It has other risks related to heart and breathing, but also swallowing and level of consciousness. And I walk them through the different organ systems and how to expect people to respond and what things to watch for. So it is, there is overlap with other muscular dystrophies, but also additional features and problems. So that's when I get an anesthesiologist on the phone, that's what we go through, and that is what is in the anesthesiology guidelines. Um, uh, and uh, some schools cover it, we do, because we want to train the next generation, um, but it, in, in, what is emphasized in, in residency may not be specific to myotonic dystrophy. Um, one of the easiest things to do to get time with doctors is when they schedule your appointment, you say, how long is it for? And you double it. And I do it, and I push for it, and I say, I need time to speak to the doctor specifically about my son's disorder and really make sure we're on the same page. And you know what? It's been very successful for me. And if it doesn't take that long, well, I've just made it so he's not seeing his next patient late. <laughs> I think that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> um, so uh, if there's any one last question or we'll wrap it up and go to the next session. I think we've gotten a lot of, a lot of good ideas. We've spent a lot of time talking about an anesthesia, which is important because it is a big problem and issue in this group and it is the one place where advocating for yourself is going to make a big difference and outcomes, but don't forget, these guidelines aren't just about anesthesia. I know you all are used to the anesthesia guidelines on the website, but there's also every other organ system from top to toe, your brain, your sleep, your eyes, your heart, your lungs, your stomach, your endocrinological, reproductive, genetic counseling. So this, this care guidelines goes way beyond just the anesthesia guidelines not just anesthesia guidelines, but the guidelines that we are, are familiar with in the past.